it should be bothering to anybody who's uh, concerned about the future of America and how, how easily and so how in such a haphazard way our politicians enact laws and policies and regulations that, that sometimes impose hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of costs on uh, corporations, which of course are all ultimately paid by you and me, the, the consumer, uh, one way or, or the other, or how lawyers uh, will drive companies out of business, uh, uh, primarily for their own financial benefit uh, through class action lawsuits, or how so many academics are sort of vicious, uh, vicious uh, attack dogs when it comes to anything with regard to uh, business. And I probably don't have to explain that to, uh, to this crowd, but I'll, I'll give you one anecdote. I was on a committee once to pick a book not too long ago that all the freshmen in my school were to read. And it was the business school's turn where I teach. You know, arts and sciences had their turn, humanities had their turn. And, uh, and uh, I thought, well, here's my chance to get all the freshmen to read a, a book about maybe American business history, the history of American entrepreneurship, something like that that 18-year-olds uh, would be interested in. And, and I picked a book by John Steele Gordon, who's a very good writer, and he had a book on uh, history of entrepreneurship. And I went to the committee meeting, and I was pretty much shouted down and condemned as an, as an immoral character for suggesting a book that was all about making money. And this was in a business school. <laughs> and so if it's like that in business schools, you can imagine uh, the humanities and our arts and sciences. And, uh, but I didn't give up the battle. We ended up adopting a book that's not that bad. Uh, after all, it was, uh, and we can talk about that later. But so that's sort of the genesis of this. And, uh, and I think uh, the first thing I do in this book is uh, explain what capitalism is. Most people don't understand what capitalism is, and a, a big uh, uh, mistake that's made in the literature and on television and in the popular culture in general is to equate capitalism with something that is not, which is uh, in, uh, 100 and some years ago used to be called mercantilism. And mercantilism is what Adam Smith railed against in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations. And in a nutshell, what that is is a set of government policies that essentially benefits the producers at the expense of the consumers. That's what mercantilism is. That's what Adam Smith was against. Capitalism is consumer oriented. True capital, the free market competition uh, is wholly, wholly oriented toward benefiting the consumer uh, above all else. And so when you see uh, uh, government, uh, corporate welfare, government money going to corporations, uh, protectionism, uh, uh, various laws and regulations that benefit a, a corporation or a group of corporations at the expense of the consumer, price supports, for example, in agriculture. These are all mercantilist policies. These are all policies that aren't capitalism, they're mercantilism. Sometimes they're called corporatism or crony capitalism, uh, but they're, they're too often conflated. And so uh, I'll give you a definition of capitalism from Adam Smith that is a, the, a short one word, one sentence definition. And, and this is what capitalism is. And I'm quoting Adam Smith. Give me that which I want and you shall have this which you want. That's it. That's, that's how a real capitalist makes money. Figures out how to give people what they want uh, in a sufficient way that they are willing to put their hand in their pocket and give him what he wants money in return. And all, all voluntary trade, of course, is mutually advantageous. Everybody benefits from it. That's what capitalism is. It's, it channels self-interest in desirable ways. Uh, my old friend, Walter Williams, who I used to teach with at uh, George Mason, I guess I left it off my resume there, that, that you had there, uh, calls dollars certificates of performance. If you have dollars in your pockets, it, it proves that one way or another, you, you uh, 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 worked together with somebody to produce some sort of service for your fellow man. Uh, that's how you got those dollars. How else would your fellow man give you those dollars? You had to provide uh, him or her uh, some useful service. Uh, another thing that is really misunderstood or not even uh, acknowledged at all about capitalism is that historically, you know, all the things that we take for ad advantage of, uh, having a refrigerator, having a car, uh, and all the, all the consumer goods that we have, Invariably, they started out as things only for the very wealthy, for the aristocracy, whoever invented these things. I even remember buying my first personal computer somewhere around 1982 when I was an assistant professor at George Mason, 
and didn't have that much money to buy a $4,000 IBM PC that was a piece of junk compared to a, today's Palm Pilots. Uh, and so, uh, but the thing about capitalism is these things all start out as the domain of the wealthy, but capitalists know you can't get rich by selling only to kings and queens and millionaires. The only way to get rich is to make it cheap enough so that everyone can buy one. And so all of these things, refrigerators, cars, personal computers, they all start out very expensive, but then the capitalists figure out how to mass produce them and produce them cheaply enough so that the average working person can afford them. And that is something that is always overlooked by the, uh, the critics of, of, cap of capitalism. Uh, on consumer sovereignty, I mentioned at the beginning that capitalism is really a system where the consumer is king. There's a great quote I'd like to share with you by Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian economist. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the teacher of Friedrich Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1974. Someone is selling a t-shirt with Hayek's picture on it downstairs at this, this convention. But one of my favorite quotes from this, uh, this great treatise by von Mises called Human Action is about the consumer. And he says this, uh, neither the entrepreneurs nor the farmers nor the capitalists determine what has to be produced. Capitalists don't do that. The consumers do that. If a businessman does not strictly obey the orders of the public as they are conveyed to him by the structure of market prices, he suffers losses, he goes bankrupt. Other men who did better in satisfying the demand of the consumers replace him. The consumers make poor people rich and rich people poor. He says they are merciless, egoistic bosses, full of whims and fancies, changeable and unpredictable. They do not care a whit for past merit and vested interests in their capacities as buyers and consumers. They are hard-hearted and callous without consideration for other people. That's uh, you, and, you and me he's, he's referring to. And it's very true, you know, if you, uh, if you buy a pair of sneakers that you've been buying uh, for the past couple of years and uh, Nike comes out with a, a superior brand, uh, every one of you would dump the old brand and buy the newer brand, especially if it's cheaper. And so, and, and uh, just think of all the people whose jobs you might have cost by doing that, if enough of you, if you do that, you know, full of whims and fancies. And, and that's exactly right. It's ultimately the consumer that's in charge. That's what makes capitalism different from uh, the alternative system, of mercantilism or socialism, where the whims of the, the, the ruling class essentially uh, or, uh, control things as opposed to, to consumers. Uh, capitalism uh, relies on property rights. You can't have capitalism without private property, and you can't have it without a, a price system whereby prices are determined by buyers and sellers, uh, supply and demand. Can't have government controlled prices. And you have to have freedom of entrepreneurship. That's what capitalism means. People have to be free to fail uh, and free to succeed as far as that goes. Um, I have a chapter on anti-capitalism. Uh, that I try to uh, explain why it is there's so much animosity toward capitalism, and I don't have time to go through all of uh, the various reasons I discuss in the book. You'll just have to buy the book to, uh, to, go, to go through all those. But uh, one thing I'd mention, though, is utopianism. Uh, one way or another, the critics of capitalism are ut utopians, and they tend to paint some sort of uh, uh, unrealistic, uh, unachievable utopian nirvana and say, this is what we want. And then they compare that to the real world and say, the real world stinks. We need to condemn the real world because it's not like our nirvana. And sometimes the utopians will look at what they think is their nirvana and will be disappointed and then they'll lie about it. And I want, I want to give you a number of examples of this whole thing. There's, there's a, a fascinating book that was published probably uh, 20 years ago or so by Paul Hollander called Political Pilgrims. And I rec highly recommend it. Uh, he, uh, he looked at um, Western journalists and professors, writers who went to Russia, China, Cuba, uh, all the uh, nirvanas of the planet, all the socialist utopias of the planet, and came back and lied about it and, and, uh, and as a way of condemning capitalism. I'll read you a few of these. Theodore Dreiser, uh, the writer, said, uh, this is under, talking about Russian communism back in the days of communism. That in Moscow, there is poverty, and there are beggars in the streets. But Lord, how picturesque, the multicolored and voluminous rags of them. They're, they're, so there were, 
there were beggars in the streets in Moscow, but they were very colorful beggars. John Dewey, the, uh, one of the <laughs> founders of the American public school monopoly, uh, said this, Soviet communism is intrinsically religious and has the moving spirit and force of primitive Christianity. Of course, uh, Christianity was outlawed in, uh, in, in Russia. Walter Duranty of the New York Times went to Russia and said, uh, the Russian granaries there are overflowing with grain and the cows are plump and contented. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, around the same time, said, there was not and could not be a food shortage in the USSR. And this was right after uh, Stalin's forced co uh, collectivization of agriculture killed six million Ukrainians, and these people went over there. Uh, W.E.B. Dubois said, although Stalin, uh, Stalin was a perfect gentleman who asked for neither adulation nor vengeance, he was reasonable and conciliatory. <laughs> uh, when I was uh, the age of some of the students in a class, uh, I was an economics major uh, 117 years ago, and I, uh, and I took uh, a course called Comparative Economic Systems, and, and uh, one of the, two of the writers were uh, Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy, and they were Marxist economists. We read the good guys and the bad guys in, uh, in this course, and Paul Baran, they're, very, they're probably the most influential Marxist economists of the 20th century, and uh, Baran said this, he described Cuba, communist Cuba, as a paradise garden where agricultural problems would melt away with a gigantic economic surplus. Uh, Paul Sweezy, his compatriot, said uh, about Cuba, you come away from Cuba's communists with your faith in the human race restored because of their purifying and liberating experiences. And the final quote I'll, I'll, I'll have here is uh, Norman Mailer who just swooned when Castro went to New York City. Uh, he said this, so Fidel Castro, I announced to the city of New York that you gave all of us some sense that there were heroes in the world. Norman Mailer, you were the first and greatest hero to appear in the world since the Second World War. And then, then I also have a quote from David Rockefeller, uh, a big love fest over Mao Zedong uh, in, in, in the book. And so, and these are, these are movers and shakers. These are important people that mold opinion who, who said these things. And they're, uh, uh, I call them the utopians because they had some vision of utopia, some sort of socialist utopia. And they condemn capitalism by praising the, these, this al these alternatives. And they're imaginary alternatives. Uh, they weren't the real alternative. They saw what was going on in Russia and Cuba and China and elsewhere. And uh, they lied about it. But uh, they got away with it for a long, long time.